This is Changing Denver. The show about our city, how we make it, and how it makes us. I'm Paul Caroli. I want to introduce you to someone. Uh, My name is Judy Danielson. In the late 1960s, Judy was in her mid-twenties, and she was a practicing physical therapist in a small, remote community in New England. And I was working in Connecticut and got an, an invitation through a Lutheran organization, Lutheran World Relief, to be a physical therapist in Vietnam doing relief work in a rehab center run by the government. And um, I hesitated. My brother's who knew a lot more about foreign policy and and U.S. policy, did not believe the war was just, didn't believe it was right, and didn't believe that they should go. And so it was uh, a question, should I do this? They convinced me that I'd be working with Vietnamese people, training them. I would uh, be training physical therapy assistants and that I get to learn a new language. I'd never been to Asia, and I accepted this position, which was life-changing for me. Having had language study, because we studied Vietnamese for three months before we went, I had a whole different experience than a military person. And um, knowing a lot of people there in Saigon, I was in Saigon, which is now Ho Chi Minh City, I uh, got to be friends with many Vietnamese people, including students who were in the law school very opposed to U.S. intervention in their country. Um, I know they were caught in the Cold War between the U.S. and Russia. It really wasn't about Vietnam. It was about this Cold War that the U.S. wanted dominance and didn't want communist, quote, Soviet Union to have a foothold there. And they were the, the victims and the guinea pigs I was horrified by finding out uh, from various students who'd been in prison that American soldiers were involved in torturing people and involved in very inhumane practices besides just being there fighting. My father was a Lutheran minister, so I had a good sense of values, but I thought my country Uh, really follow those values at all times as well. So it was a bit of a shock to go to Vietnam and see what life was like. Vietnam altered Judy's entire worldview and energized her. After she moved back to the United States and settled here in Colorado, she joined the peace movement. And then I got involved with an organization called Clergy and Laity Concerned About Vietnam. This was in 1970, one year after the second big fire out at Rocky Flats. Remember, that fire led to an explosion of media attention on the plant, and a local scientist, Ed Martell, decided that the public needed an independent study of possible off-site contamination. So he and an assistant went and dug up small soil samples near the plant, tested them, and reported that they had found relatively high levels of plutonium and americium. In some cases, hundreds of times larger than amounts typically found in the environment. It was the first time anyone had put forth evidence that contradicted the official story coming out of the Atomic Energy Commission and the Rocky Flats plant. You know, uh, before Martel's study, a lot of people had no idea what that plant did. Uh, It was so secretive that people who were in the families of employees there, some thought that they made laundry detergents or soaps or, um, you know, things that had nothing to do with war. When Judy and her group of peace activists heard about this, they saw it for what it was, an opportunity to bring their struggle against war and the military-industrial complex home to Colorado. And uh, we formed an organization called Citizens Concerned About Radiation Pollution, about Rocky Flats, and so... Our little group went around with baggies and walked around the neighborhoods 
um, in the vicinity of Rocky Flats and asked people if we could go into their backyards, scoop a teaspoon of soil, put it in the baggie with their address and uh, information for contact. And we stuffed all these baggies in a suitcase. And it was an election year. And we take them uh, to various candidates for office and present the suitcase and say, your constituents have radi- we believe they have radiation in their backyard from all these fires at Rocky Flats and the accidents they've had there. And we would like you to take these and get them tested and let your constituents know what this plant is doing. Just for a second, I want you to put yourself in the position of a politician being presented with a suitcase like this. Your constituents appear to have irradiated themselves and you in order to make a point. How can you possibly ignore it? The answer is, you can't. Even if you don't really believe their stories, you can tell others will. You have to do something. That power, wielded by a few in defense of the many, the power that Judy and her friends captured through ingenuity, effort, and sheer will, that's what today's episode is all about. The people who sought that power and those who found it. Presented in partnership with the Denver Public Library and the Colorado Independent, Changing Denver presents Unclear Danger, the Colorado story of Rocky Flats. Chapter 2. Local Hazard, Global Threat. After the soil sampling campaign, Judy kept organizing around Rocky Flats. And in 1974, she and another young activist by the name of Pam Solo were hired on to share a staff job at the Denver office of the American Friends Service Committee. The AFSC was almost 60 years old at that point, and its Quaker brand of pacifism had earned a reputation for social change. The AFSC hired Judy and Pam to formalize their Rocky Flats protests to take them to the next level. Nationally, AFSC is a national organization. The group wanted to do something about the B-1 bomber that was being built by Rockwell. And the um, B-1 bomber production sites were all over the country, but we had none here. Zero. However, uh, Rockwell International was the producer, and Rockwell was bidding on uh, the management of Rocky Flats. And so we uh, organized a lot of letter-writing campaigns, talked to officials and scientists, and uh, got people to write to Rockwell, encouraging them not to take on this this, uh, bid. This was the beginning of an organization called the Rocky Flats Action Group. Judy and Pam organized campaign after campaign, event after event, all linking their concerns about the local impact of the plant with the threat of nuclear war. Pam Solo uh, was a student of Gandhi and believed in trying to have a campaign that spoke to every person in the community in a way that would touch their lives, I guess. They reached out to elected officials, the state health department, leaders of the Rocky Flats Workers Union, landowners around the plant, scientists, and health professionals. We had groups in various community groups. There was a group in Golden and various other groups. We had student activists working on this issue. We talked to churches. We went everywhere. Once Rockwell International won the bid and took over as lead contractor in 1975, Judy and Pam reached out to Rockwell executives. The new team was eager to distance themselves from Dow Chemical, so they developed a relationship with the activists. Throughout all this, Judy and Pam were learning what all the major stakeholders wanted and adjusting their strategy accordingly. The workers wanted job security and safety, so the action group compromised and called for the plant to be converted rather than shut down entirely. 
The politicians wanted to get re-elected, so the action group pushed for as broad a base of support as possible. Rockwell and the federal government basically wanted to be free of the hassle, so, well, the action group couldn't really accommodate everyone, could they? Instead, Judy and Pam took all this information and all their hopes and dreams for the future and distilled them down into a simple, catchy slogan that you may have already guessed. Oh, I wish I could tell. Who thought of it? But clearly, Rocky Flats is a, was a local, local hazard, hazard. And the global, global threat. threat had to do with the threat of nuclear war. In Lynn Ackland's magnificent history of Rocky Flats, Making a Real Killing, he writes about tensions within the nascent activist movement. National environmental groups were more focused on commercial nuclear power plants at the time, and they were worried about getting caught up in Cold War politics. The peace activists on the other side pushed to make a more explicit connection between Rocky Flats, U.S. military spending, and the global effects of an arms buildup. This is all the backdrop for what came next. The Lamworth Task Force had delivered its report in 1975 recommending that operations at Rocky Flats be phased out, but Rockwell and the federal government weren't making any moves to implement that recommendation. Here's Pam Solo, speaking in an interview archived at the Maria Rogers Oral History Program at the Boulder Public Library about their next big strategic decision. So then it, it was at that point that it became obvious to us that we could push Rocky Flats up to a certain point, but that then the congressional delegation and the governor's office would just get us back in, in the cul-de-sac of more commissions and more studies and, you know, monitoring and... All that was a way of patting the public on the head and uh, not doing anything. Right. So I called the, uh, Judy and I talked about it, and we called the FOR and said, you know, we can't, we have to make this a national issue. The FOR is the Fellowship of Reconciliation, a national peace and justice group with local chapters all across the country. Something larger has to happen. And so we started the process of discussing a, joint, a jointly sponsored thing with the FOR, and then working our way through the uh, decision-making levels within the service committee about putting an enormous uh, amount of resources and focus on making Rocky Flats the symbol of, uh, of the arms race and helping us make it a national issue. So in 77, uh, we made that determination and started organizing in that direction, and then I started doing nothing but traveling around the country talking to people and doing radio talk shows and public speaking and so on and so forth to talk about. They started planning a rally for the end of April 1978. And because they wanted to make this a national issue, they invited the highest profile anti-nuclear weapons activists they could think of. My trial for having given the Pentagon Papers having ended in 1973 and the war had ended in 1975. Uh, almost immediately then, as soon as the war had ended, I set to work trying to help build a movement against nuclear weapons comparable to the movement against the Vietnam War that might ultimately even cut off the money for the arms race the way that Congress had eventually cut off the money for the Vietnam War, and that was how the In case you don't recognize him by that backstory, this is Daniel Ellsberg, the government researcher who came to prominence after he leaked the classified report that became known as the Pentagon Papers in 1971. So, I forget whether they invited me first or I invited myself, I think they called me up, and, uh, but I, I quickly agreed that I would come and do some preliminary publicity for the rally they had scheduled for April 29th, and I agreed that I would be part of the rally. In the mid to late 1970s, Ellsberg had the kind of star power that amplified the local hazard global threat message beyond what Judy and Pam were capable of on their own. And although they had been working very well and their brochure was terrific, for over a year and a half, I think two years or so at this point, I found that in every program I was on in, in Denver, and I was on most of the talk shows, the morning shows, the morning shows, not one of these people who had agreed to interview me were aware what Rocky Flats did, which was showed a considerable limitation of uh, up to that point of the outreach of this program. Efficiently, these people were really good, but nobody knew. And I remember in particular one interviewer saying, well, why are you against nuclear power? And I said, do you know what they do at Rocky Flats? 
She says, well, isn't it a nuclear power plant? Which was what everybody thought, actually. And uh, I said, the only power they produce at Rocky Flats is the power to end life on Earth. Judy and Pam planned a weekend of events around the big rally on the 29th, starting with a series of workshops on nonviolence and consensus building, and a smaller kickoff rally in Denver's Civic Center. And that was focused on human needs. We had people like Stokely Carmichael, who had been in the Black Panthers, come and talk about the needs of African American people of color. And uh, Rich Castro, who was uh, one of our legislators here from the Latino community, gave a very important speech. Why are we spending all our money on weapons that we hope will never be used and not spending on people? The next day, we went out to Rocky Flats, had a big rally, had speakers, and I remember that the uh, rally was a, was a very hot day, April 29th, and I was waiting to speak. And it was so hot uh, listening to speakers that I, I didn't have any uh, hat. And I, need, I don't normally wear a hat. So I went across the square to a Stetson store and bought a, a Stetson, rather expensive. But it was the only kind of sun hat they had. Around 5,000 people gathered under that hot sun to call for the conversion of the plant. As the day wore on, the sun slowly dipped behind the mountains, and they sang songs and swapped stories. And as the afternoon wore on out there in the evening, as I recall, a uh, rain started, which got heavier and heavier. I think it was kind of drizzly and cold, but everyone was so committed. The plan was for everyone to join together that night and, in an act of civil disobedience, block the train tracks leading into the Rocky Flats plant. Judy and Pam had prearranged all of this with Rockwell and the relevant authorities. All they wanted was a symbolic show of force to build pressure on Governor Dick Lamb. Yes, well, uh, well, they said, they didn't emphasize that it was symbolic, by the way. That was a retrospective uh, uh, mention. In fact, they didn't say symbolic at all. We had committed to leaving the next day. And um, partly was we had more plans. The next day, we'd invited the Natural Resources Defense Council to come and have a hearing with scientists and down at the post office building downtown. But it was definitely not uh, prescribed that we would end the action Sunday morning, but rather that there would be a consensus about that. That would be, uh, much, was, much emphasis was put on the point, this is being done by consensus, and although this, this, this first step has, of course, been structured by the organizers, you know, uh, before we all got together, but once we were together, decision-making from then on would be done by consensus. It was a wet and cold night, and by the time the sun came up, only 29 dedicated activists were left on the tracks. At that point, I thought, well, why... Why uh, end the action now? I mean, if people are, are strong enough to stay on these tracks here, uh, let's make it a little longer action. And obviously they are willing to get arrested. And uh, I think we had a meeting, a consensus meeting, and I think I raised the thought that uh, we should talk about whether we didn't want to stay here longer, at least till Monday. And I had They stayed on the tracks until Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and the next Wednesday and the Wednesday after that. People came and went, but always at least one activist was firmly planted on those tracks. It got to the point where they needed a name for their ragtag group. Uh, I, I am deeply committed to nonviolence. And this was true of all these people on the tracks, clearly. So I said, maybe we should use a name that comes right out for once. And um, I couldn't say we're pacifists, but it makes clear that we're nonviolent. Maybe we should use the name that Gandhi gave to his nonviolent actions, Satyagraha, which, he, which translates as soul force or truth force. But Satyagraha, that's what he called his actions. And so somebody said, well, that's, that's too foreign sounding, and nobody will know what it means. So forth. So somebody said, someone, not me, said, well, how about truth force? 
Rocky Flats Truth Force. And I think actually, even the people there last night, I think very few people remembered how that arose. Now, I really knew what happened. Edward Abbey, One Man's Nuclear War. Harper's Magazine, March 1979. A canvas teepee straddles the railroad tracks, clearly obstructing passage. The railway, a spur, curves across a field of tawny grass and basaltic rocks toward the distant complex of buildings, towers, lights, enclosed within a high security fence topped with barbed wire, patrolled by armed guards. Occasional wisps of steam rise from the short stacks within the plant, fading out in the chilly blue as they drift towards the rich brown haze of Denver, 16 miles to the southeast. West of the railroad and the highway nearby stand the foothills of the front range of the Rocky Mountains. A steady stream of truck and auto traffic moves on the highway, but few of the drivers of these vehicles pause to wonder at the strange sight of a wigwam erected across a railroad track. Mostly local people, they've doubtless grown accustomed to this oddity, the archaic tent has been standing here for most of the past six months. They do not consider the wigwam on the tracks, barring the right-of-way near a sign that reads U.S. property, no trespassing, a form of violence. Once a week, when the train comes, the short train of specially designed armored cars marked fizzle material radioactive. Patrick Malone and helpers dismantle the tent and carry it out of the way, saving it from confiscation and the security forces from unnecessary paperwork. Then he and friends, a series of them totaling about 200 so far, return to the railway and sit on the tracks, offering only their bodies to the advancing engine. The train always halts, or has so far, and the people on the rails are taken away by the police, booked for trespass and obstruction of traffic, and jailed or released on their own recognizance. This scene has been repeated more than 20 times since April 29th, 1978. I had come to the Rocky Flats affair in a state of mind vaguely sympathetic with the protesters, but basically skeptical, detached, burdened by the resigned cynicism that passes for wisdom in contemporary America. Like some people I know, I could sometimes settle for the belief that our most serious problems are finding a place to park the car the ever-rising cost of gasoline and beefsteak, the nagging demands of the poor, the old, the disinherited. Now I felt a guilty envy of the protesters, of those who actually act, and a little faint glow of hope. Perhaps something fundamental might yet be changed in the nature of our lives. Crusaders for virtue are an awkward embarrassment to any society. They force us to make choices. Either side with them, which is difficult and dangerous, or condemn them, which leads to self-betrayal. Daniel Ellsberg and the Rocky Flats Truth Force attracted attention to the plant like no action had before. But for Judy Danielson, Pam Solo, and the rest of the Rocky Flats Action Group, that was alienating. The Truth Force put up a teepee and people took off their shirts and they were walking around. Uh, There were a lot of hippie, quote-unquote, people there, which kind of changed the public attitude, I think, toward this very serious issue (laughs) and made it easier to dismiss it in some ways. Dan Ellsberg was right. We need to fight it in any way we can. Uh, But uh, it just wasn't part of our plan, and so we felt kind of undercut. Judy and Pam watched from afar as the truth force captured the public's imagination and redefined their protests. All the careful strategizing they'd done, all the outreach with the scientific community, all the coalition building and politicking and slow, determined growth, that was over. This was the truth force's movement now. But the truth force, being with these people, this deeply committed people who, who uh, just in many ways, if you, that was the happiest time of my adult life. I look back on that still at 72 now and can say, you people who are with me, they're my brothers and sisters. Uh, I always uh, feel absolutely bonded to them because uh, I loved being with them and it was a happy time. In the foothills of East Colorado 
Where the grass grows delicious and tall The cows all agree with each other They don't like radiation at all No nukes, no nukes No radioactive junk in my milk if you please No nukes, no nukes We'd rather make ice cream and cheese One year after the April 29th protest, the Rocky Flats Truth Force led another rally out at the plant. 9,000 people showed up this time, and more than 200 were arrested. Their efforts continued drawing attention from the press and provided cover for liberal Boulder politicians to increase pressure on the plant. But at the same time, their tactics sparked a response from the Rocky Flats Workers' Union. More than 16,000 people attended a pro-nuclear rally outside the plant on August 26, 1979. And a few years later, in November 1982, Colorado voters weighed an initiative to levy a tax that would have allowed the governor to promote the halt of production at Rocky Flats. It was defeated. By a lot. In October 1983, around 17,000 peace activists joined hands to almost entirely encircle Rocky Flats. It was a romantic expression of dissent, but there was also a general feeling that it wouldn't have much of an effect. All of this combined to make Rocky Flats a national story, just like Pam and Judy wanted. But it was divisive, and for many, easy to ignore. Just another hippy-dippy protest. Remember that power we talked about earlier? The radioactive suitcase? The perfect confluence of leverage, opportunity, and will? Two years after the Truth Force commandeered their movement, Judy and Pam had both moved on to other issues. And I think they took the suitcase with them. So Rockwell, stop making those triggers Before we're all blown up or dead And to use all the skills of your workers could make us new milk trucks instead Singing no nukes, no nukes No radioactive junk in my milk if you please No nukes, no nukes We'd rather make ice cream and cheese At the next Rocky Flats demonstration There's one new affinity group You'll know them by horn and by udders They'll be our most militant group And as they haul them off to jail they'll sing No nukes, no nukes No radioactive junk in my milk if you please No nukes, no Cream and cheese. Before we move forward, we're going to have to back up a bit, just a little bit, back to the 1978 rally and the birth of the Truth Force. As you heard, Judy Danielson was disappointed with how events unfolded that fateful weekend. But from darkness came a ray of light. Out of that rally, though, came Leroy Moore, who is a professor at Isle of School of Theology. And Leroy took on this campaign and has never let it go. Leroy Moore is perhaps the single most influential person in the history of Rocky Flats. So you really should get to know him. Well, I'm Leroy Moore. I was born in Nashville, Tennessee, grew up in Dallas, Texas. Leroy is a small man in his late 80s with a closet full of worn fleece and flannel. Many years ago, when he was much younger, he attended Baylor as an undergrad before moving on to the seminary and later Claremont Graduate University for a Ph.D. in religion and U.S. history. I won't go through the history of my teaching at various places, but I came to Colorado in 1974 to teach at the University of Denver, and I'd never heard of Rocky Flats at the time. Leroy had been active in the civil rights movement, And by this point, he had developed a pretty specific set of principles to guide his life, his activism, and his teaching. In my teaching, I used to tell students that I'm going to give you homework for the rest of your life. 
one thing that may destroy human life on this planet is a nuclear holocaust. So we really need to do something about nuclear weapons. Uh, the second major threat to us is ecological uh, or environmental disaster that we can't recover from. And of course now that's really become big in the society with global warming and everything associated with it. And the third uh, danger is authoritarian government. That is decisions being made by others, either secretly or without any control by the people. When Leroy read reports and saw photos of Daniel Ellsberg and the Truth Force out at Rocky Flats in 1978, he saw a single place, a single issue, where all three of those threats converged. So I immediately got involved with the Rocky Flats. And and, uh, and I realized at the time that if we could manage to stop the manufacturing of nuclear weapons, which is what the, the truth force, the people sitting on the tracks, intended to do, then we would have to face the um, environmental problem because plutonium with a long half-life, it'll be dangerous for 500,000 years. You know, and the hu- human existence is so brief by comparison to that that um, it's going to be a problem essentially forever. Leroy saw the full picture that Judy and Pam painted earlier in the 70s. The global threat, yes, but also the local hazard. And just to clarify, the half-life of plutonium, which is the amount of time it would take for plutonium to decay to half its initial radioactivity, is a little more than 24,000 years. So I'm not exactly sure what Leroy meant when he was talking about 500,000 years, but still, 24,000 years is a very long time, and I think his point stands. But back to the story. Leroy Moore ended up joining the Truth Force on the railroad tracks in 1979. He got arrested for his first act of civil disobedience, and in 1983, just a few months before the encirclement, he and a few other Truth Force veterans founded a new organization, the Rocky Mountain Peace and Justice Center. Today, you may know the Peace and Justice Center as a hub of progressive politics and nonviolence in Boulder, one of the pillars of Boulder's crunchy reputation. But from the beginning, Rocky Flats has always been one of their top issues. Through the Peace and Justice Center, Leroy and his colleagues took the reins of the activist movement in the 80s. They did educational outreach, numerous public actions, cheered on the FBI and EPA raid in 1989, toasted the official end of production in 1992, and then, just as Leroy predicted, they pivoted. Okay, let's talk about the activist movement again, after the closure. After the closure. Yeah, how did it change? Well, uh, suddenly... uh... At the, at the when they were preparing for the cleanup and even starting the cleanup, activists suddenly were not just uh, trying to draw attention to the danger of the plant and doing acts of civil disobedience, but we had to become uh, lobbyists, and so we were making journeys to Washington to talk to members of Congress about what's going on with the cleanup and to try to give give them information that they might not that they weren't hearing from the Department of Energy. At the same time, the Peace and Justice Center was not the only organization recalibrating its position after the 1989 raid. In 1991, the state of Colorado and the EPA entered an interagency agreement with the Department of Energy to become lead regulators of the Rocky Flats site. That agreement, which we have a link to at changingdenver.com, stipulated that the DOE shall, quote, develop and implement a community relations plan which responds to the need for an interactive relationship with all interested community elements in the Rocky Flats area. That tiny passage translated into a slew of community engagement efforts. Basically, there were a lot of groups popping up with names like Citizens Advisory Board and Future Site Use Working Group. There was a lot of money involved and a lot of careers on the line. And through this dense bureaucratic thicket, Leroy Moore plunged like a machete. Well, first of all, let me just say that I think Leroy specifically and the community in general played a critical role. This is Robert Card, CEO of Kaiser Hill when it was the lead contractor on the cleanup. We're hearing this interview courtesy of the Maria Rogers Oral History Program. Um, 
if 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 he didn't exist, we would have had to manufacture it. So Leroy and and uh, Peace and Justice Center and others provided a very important touchstone on on one end of the spectrum for how we were doing and what needed to be done. Uh, I thought they they had very intellectually sound arguments. They were technically good. Did we disagree with them a lot? Yes, we did. But I think it was an honorable disagreement. This is not a unique perspective, by the way. Practically every government official or contractor I've talked to or heard discuss the cleanup era speaks with a similar begrudging respect for Leroy and the Peace and Justice Center. They attended every meeting, pushed back on proposals they didn't like, and flat out did the work. First of all, when the, when the mission was changed from production to cleanup, very soon after that, the Department of Energy got a group of people together that, that it called the Rocky Flats Future Site Use Working Group, and I happened to be, was on that group. The Future Site Use Working Group convened in 1994. Members included representatives of local governments like Arvada and Westminster, as well as the Sierra Club, the Old Rocky Flats Union, and other members of the community. The, the Energy Department said, uh, we want you to tell us what you want for the future of Rocky Flats. And, so, and, and the, the group had one year in which to answer this question. We were created just to answer this one question. They met every month for a year. And on June 22, 1995, they published a report with suggestions for waste disposal, plutonium storage, protection of the buffer zone area, and most importantly, a few options for possible future uses of the site. Each of those followed a single underlying recommendation. We produced a recommendation that said we wanted the Rocky Flat site to be cleaned up to the um, average background level for plutonium in the environment from fallout. Okay, let me explain that. Plutonium is generally understood to be a man-made element. So before it was discovered in 1940, there weren't more than infinitesimally small traces of it in the environment. In the 1940s, 50s, 60s, and 70s, countries around the world tested nuclear weapons in the atmosphere. These tests, as well as the bombs that devastated Hiroshima and Nagasaki, produced radioactive debris, which has since spread across the globe. So now, when Leroy says they wanted to clean up rocky flats to background levels of plutonium, what he's saying is that these community groups wanted the DOE to clean up all the contamination the rocky flats plant produced, no more and no less. It sounds reasonable, but this proved to be the root of a brewing conflict between Leroy and his colleagues and the regulatory agencies. While they weighed in on, on individual cleanup decisions, it was always in the background there was cleanup to background. That was always sort of infused into everything they did. This is David Abelson. Congressman David Skaggs hired him to manage his Rocky Flats portfolio back in 1995. You know, people might say, well, why not? Why shouldn't you? Right. And there's a certain sort of moral argument you could make that, hey, why not clean this up to the way it was before the arms race started? That is simply not the way federal law works. It's not the way federal lawmakers are going to operate. It's not the way the governor's office is going to press or members of Congress or state legislators. And it's ultimately not the way local elected officials are going to engage because they recognize that, yes, these sites are contaminated because of human action. And unfortunately, you can't return them to those pre-production days. In 1996, the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment, the EPA, and the DOE reached an agreement on how the cleanup would proceed. Among the goals outlined therein was this passage. Quote, Where possible, the site will be cleaned up to the maximum extent feasible. While many in the community expressed a desire for cleanup that would achieve average background levels, that is beyond the reach of today's technology, budgetary resources, and legal requirements. So instead of cleaning up to background, they needed some other, cheaper, more feasible standard to guide them. 
They worked backwards based on an accepted estimated radiation dose for an office worker in the former industrial area and a recreational user in the buffer zone. And they came up with a series of radionuclide soil action levels, or RSALs. These are levels of radionuclides, like plutonium, at which remediation action would be required. And plutonium was the, the, essentially the singular concern of the communities, of the local governments, of the activists, of the environmental groups. Everybody was plutonium. Now, before I tell you the RSAL they proposed for plutonium, let me just quickly say that the U.S. Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry reports that the average amount of plutonium in surface soil from fallout is between 0.01 and 0.1 picocuries per gram, a picocurie being a standard measure for low levels of radioactivity. Okay, so the Rocky Flats Cleanup Agreement of 1996 put forth an RSAL for plutonium of 651 picocuries per gram. In other words, many, many times higher than background. And uh, I, I can remember very clearly the meeting where this was announced. Oh, I, I, before I went to the meeting, I just happened to look at the Boulder paper like I do every morning, and it's a very short article about two inches long, very, very small article that said that yesterday the uh, Department of Energy and the regulators had agreed on a cleanup standard for the Rocky Flat site. And um, it didn't say what the amount was. And I looked up the man that was uh, in charge of the meeting it was going to facilitate, and I said, we, we need to hear from the, some, either the DOE or the regulators what decision they made yesterday about the cleanup, what level of cleanup it will be. And the guy said, no, no, I can't do that. And I said, well, you must. Uh, you must do it. Can he finally agree that he would ask this, somebody to announce it? So sure enough, one of those people went to the microphone and he announced <laughs> And the room exploded. I mean, there were people were so angry. When the community pushed back, when the local governments pushed back, one of the things that Congressman David Skaggs did was secure funding to have an independent oversight and an independent review of those numbers. The community sort of form their own group. They had something called the Oversight Panel. So you got this horrible acronym called the ARSALOP. They had half a million dollars and they hired their own scientist out of South Carolina named John Till with the Risk Assessment Corporation. And they went through an exhaustive process of looking at all sorts of future use scenarios and with that uh, ingestion, rates, basically kids eating soil, inhalation rates, you know, breathing air and drinking water and all of these different parameters. And they looked at that, that data and they said, well, the most conservative future use scenario that we could come up with would be called the resident ranching family. And that's a, a ranching family that gets all its food, water, and vegetables from the site. The number they came up with was 35 pico curies per gram. 35, of course, being much lower than 651. An action level of 35 meant that the cleanup would have to be more intense. More areas would need attention. More staff would be needed. More money. More everything, really. This process took years, by the way. In the meantime, the DOE and Kaiser Hill reached a new agreement with benchmarks, a bonus structure, and a shared goal of completing the cleanup by 2006. Congress passed a bill dictating that much of the buffer zone should be turned over to fish and wildlife for use as a wildlife refuge in 2001. And it was after all this, in late 2002, that the DOE responded to the ARCELOP recommendation with proposed alterations to the 1996 agreement. They put forth a new action level for plutonium, 50 picocuries, which seemed like a major concession, but for the first time they also stratified the action levels based on soil depth, the 50 picocurie action level was only for the top three feet of surface soil. 
between 3 and 6 feet, the action level was set at 1,000 Pyco Curies. Below 6 feet, there was no action level at all. Unlimited plutonium was allowed to remain. After the closure, did you ever have faith in the process? Did I ever have faith in the process? Yeah. Uh, like you participated in this future working group? You... When, when the Citizens Advisory Board was first created, uh, there was a former uh, worker that, or rather, he was, a, he, was, he, he was a man that was in charge of plutonium work. And he said, uh, I'm, I'm going to show you about plutonium on this site. He spoke very frankly to me. And uh, I thought at that time, well, finally, after all of these years of misrepresentation, we're going to see the, we're going to begin to see the truth, and then we can deal with things as they you know as they exist. But very soon after that, I realized that was that was an idle hope. Step by step, the longest march can be won can be won many stones can form an arch singly none singly none then by union what we will can be accomplished still drops of water turn the mill singly none singly none In the late 90s and early 2000s, there was a lot of public interest in the cleanup and in Leroy's criticism. But after the DOE certified that the process was complete on December 8, 2005, that started to dwindle. All the contaminated buildings were shipped out of state. All the specific sites that exceeded the new radionuclide soil action levels were remediated. After extensive soil sampling, they determined that nowhere in the donut area that would later become the wildlife refuge even needed to be remediated at all. It was left alone. The regulatory agencies ultimately certified in 2006 that the future refuge lands were available for, quote, unlimited use, and the EPA delisted them from the National Priorities List of Superfund sites. As the years passed, more and more bureaucracy was layered on top of the Soil Action Levels decision and the 2006 certification. And Leroy found himself on the margins. All of a sudden, his was an alternative perspective. Regulatory officials would say things like, We respect what the activists did to get the plant shut down, but now they're not being realistic. Leroy and the Peace and Justice Center kept the drumbeat going and they slowly collected a motley crew of independent scientists and other experts that rejected the official story about the cleanup. But at the same time, I think that, to many people in the community, all of this must have felt like a big relief, like the end of a long, arduous journey. And that finally, after more than 50 years, that pesky Rocky Flats problem was gone, and that it was time to heal. After this short break, and a word from one of the other members of the Denver Podcast Network, we're going to talk about healing and how difficult it can be, especially when plutonium is involved. You're listening to Denver Orbit, featuring voices. I'm going to give you an awkwardly long and uncomfortable list of reasons why you shouldn't shave outside. Stories. Now, he was very outspoken about the effects of, of war on himself. In music from Colorado's creative community. Listen at denverorbit.com or on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher, or most other podcast apps. On this Sunday, May 11, 1969, the Colorado sun is clear and bright and it's Mother's Day. My sisters and I wear matching dresses and saddle shoes. Kurt has on a little sweater and tie, and my dad wears a clean shirt. 
At the restaurant, our favorite Italian place, my mother tells us to behave ourselves as we straggle from the car and gather around the fountain on the restaurant's patio. This is an excerpt from a book called Full Body Burden, Growing Up in the Nuclear Shadow of Rocky Flats. The author's name? Kristen Iverson. My dad digs into his pocket for pennies and we each make a wish before dropping one into the water. This means you'll always come back, my dad says. Just like the fountain in Rome, it's like a curse. Well, this is actually the opening scene of of my book. It was a a very important scene for me to write. Um, On May 11th, 1969, I was with my two sisters and my brother and my parents, and it was Mother's Day, and we were out having um, Sunday brunch on a restaurant patio, and we did not know that that there was a fire at Rocky Flats, um, that the fire was racing through the glove box line, that the roof was melting, um, that there was a, a very real and potentially devastating uh, danger. In fact, um, it's the, the AEC itself said that we came close to the DOE, a Chernobyl-like accident. Um, and if that had happened, and we came within seconds of that happened, of course, if that had happened, I wouldn't be here talking to you today. But there was no Chernobyl-like accident. And Kristen Iverson grew up, went to college, had kids. When I was getting my PhD at the University of Denver, and I was a single parent with two little kids, and I needed uh, to work to put myself uh, through graduate school, and I decided to take a job out at the plant. Um, it, it was good benefits, good pay, and I was a, a good writer. And so I had the opportunity to do some technical writing and work on reports and things like that. Kristen started working at Rocky Flats right before the cleanup started in earnest in late 1994. A couple of months later, on December 20th, she came home, put her kids to bed. And then I came downstairs and turned on the television, and there was a Nightline expose on Rocky Flats. December 20th, 1994. It was production, production, production. Safety... Safety was a word. Uh, It wasn't really practiced. It was the first thing I'd ever really seen that was as detailed and frank. Um, Some of the people that I worked with, including Mark Silverman, who was um, the DOE manager out there, and and others, um, to Mark Silverman's credit, he he was forthright. He said, things are a mess out here. We have put our workers at risk, and we have put people who live, you know, in the area at risk. It's, it's, It's an incredible documentary. And I just sat there, and my heart sank. And I thought, how can I live next to this plant and work at this plant and not know, not know all of this and not know how bad it is, how bad it continues to be. Um, and that was, the, that was the moment that I knew I would quit. And the day that I quit, I knew I would someday write a book about it. It took her 10 years to write Full Body Burden. And it shows. It's truly a beautiful book. As you've heard over the past few minutes, she is very good at taking enormous systemic issues and presenting them on a human scale with a human face. Full Body Burden does that with the Rocky Flat story. It's at one time a memoir about her father's alcoholism and her family's subsequent dissolution and a rigorous investigation into the tragic history of the plant. When it was published in 2012, The New York Times called it a potent examination of the dangers of secrecy, and it quickly became a hit in literary circles. It won a Colorado Book Award and a Reading the West Award. Kirkus Reviews and the American Library Association both called it one of the best books of the year. The Atlantic named it a best book about justice. One thing that began to happen almost immediately uh, was that I started getting emails from people who are sick. And, uh, and, and that just turned into a, a, an onslaught that continues to the present day. These are people who, not just workers, but this is also true for all the residential areas around the plant as well. And um, so I think that was really the first surprising thing that happened to me was that I began to get the stream of stories of, of people who had cancer. They were sick or their kids were sick. It was heartbreaking for me. It was difficult for me because there was... Um, no place to send these people for help. You know, there wasn't any sort of 
assistance or public health monitoring or anything like that. Here's what I think happened. Kristen's book took all of the years of criticism Leroy Moore and his colleagues had been building up, the entire alternative narrative about Rocky Flats and the cleanup, and imposed an emotional framework on top of it. People across Arvada, Broomfield, Westminster, and other downwind communities saw themselves in Kristen's story. It's been the book that has awakened a lot of people, made them aware of uh, you know, the situation right there in their own neighborhood. Where before they saw relatives suffering with cancer and didn't know how to cope with it, all of a sudden they had this big evil thing to focus all that resentment and fear and anger. My name's Tiffany Hansen, and I'm co-founder of the Rocky Flats Downwinders. Back in 2014, Tiffany was living downwind of Rocky Flats. She was having some health problems, so she did what many of us do and scoured the internet for answers. The Google search came up with nuclear waste. And I was like, I don't know anything about nuclear waste. So I put nuclear waste Arvada and then Rocky Flats popped up. And then I started my journey of trying to figure out what Rocky Flats was all about. Tiffany reached out to friends and family to see if they were having similar health problems and found that yes, there did seem to be a lot of people in her community with these types of issues. And yes, other people were suspicious about possible connections to Rocky Flats. Tiffany organized these people under the Rocky Flats Downwinders banner in 2015. Primarily, it's a support group for people who lived and are living downwind of the plant site. Our biggest um, efforts right now are just trying to build awareness in the community about what was going on at Rocky Flats, the history of the plant, and um, about the communities that have lived around the plant, the health of the people living around the plant, and just let them know both about the past about Rocky Flats and that it still is a part of the community today because people's lives are impacted, their health is impacted. Tiffany doesn't talk a lot about this, but a quick scan of the group's social media presence shows that implicit in this mission is a political agenda. Hashtag peeps in protest. For Tiffany, keeping people healthy means keeping people away from Rocky Flats. Hashtag keep kids off Rocky Flats. Keeping the wildlife refuge closed. Hashtag nuclear neighbor. Opposing Jefferson County's long gestating plan to build a parkway through the refuge. Hashtag no to Plutonium Parkway. And pursuing the truth that the DOE, EPA, and CDPHE supposedly aren't telling us. Hashtag Plutonium Kills. And the Downwinders aren't the only group pushing for these things. Another group, Candelis Glows, started up in 2013 and focuses specifically on the Candelis housing development that was built along the refuge's southeastern boundary. There's also Rocky Flats Right to Know, which was founded by two grandmothers, Marion Whitney and Bonnie Graham Reed. They organize protests, talk to people at farmers markets, and every month they invite experts like Leroy Moore to come address their group on various issues related to Rocky Flats. All of these experts um, who, are, who are passionate about this and know the truth are volunteering their time. They just want to protect people's health. They have no other motive. This is a big theme in my conversation with Bonnie and Marion. They are very suspicious that the regulatory agencies and the politicians and the landowners all have other motivations behind their narrative. They have a really, really financial interest in, in having um, this narrative that it's safe and cleaned up and or didn't exist at all. Decades of secrecy at the plant left a lasting legacy of distrust in this community. In 2013, 2014, and 2015, these groups and others like them gained some traction. But instead of fading away alongside the buzz around full-body burden, the imminent opening of the refuge lent their calls urgency. It was easier to imagine hikers, bikers, and children visiting the refuge, and their numbers swelled. Now, I don't know for sure, but based on conversations with people in these groups and a quick scan of the internet, it looks to me like they have a few thousand members and followers on social media between them. And I understand why people are joining these groups, but personally, I don't find them very persuasive. Leroy Moore and the 20 or so experts that have come into his orbit, on the other hand, that's a different story. 
I remember a while back, I drove out to Boulder for an interview with one of these people, a biologist, Dr. Harvey Nichols. The DOE contracted Nichols to study airborne particles at Rocky Flats back in the 70s, and he's been involved in some fashion ever since. In our conversation, he didn't talk about Google searches or anything like that. It's, it's a funny term, activist. I, I use it amongst our, uh, within the group, um, but it's always in quotes because it, for a lot of people on the outside, um, it implies somebody that uh, has unruly hair maybe or uh, has a big uh, sign and parades up and down and shouts, makes a lot of trouble. I don't know. He spoke like a scientist with uncertainty about areas outside his expertise and supreme confidence in the broader group's general conclusions. We've got over 300 years of direct experience at Rocky Flats. I remember thinking to myself on the drive home from that interview, these experts might be onto something here. I set out to tell both sides of the story, but what if they're right? What are the implications of that? The government does have a history of mismanaging this site, after all. Do I have an obligation to take a stand? This is why we demand our day in court, effectively, in front of the National Academy. These are our data. Look at them. Do you believe them? Do you believe us? In other words, I felt it. I finally understood how these community groups and experts, in their own way, were reviving the legacy of Judy Danielson and Pam Solo, channeling the spirit of the truth force in Daniel Ellsberg, paying the hosting fees to keep Leroy Moore's decades of research online and freely available, and writing a new chapter to Kristen Iverson's book. They were building something bigger, something that started to resemble, well, not quite a radioactive suitcase, but something else. If the activists are, let's say, the shaft of a spear, but without a pointed head. They, on their own, have some influence. We are the smaller group, the, the point of the spear. We've got all this technical knowledge. And again, on our own, we have some impact, but uh, modest. Combine the spear head, the point, with the shaft, you get something really quite powerful. Next time on Unclear Danger, the Colorado story of Rocky Flats. What happens when this spear comes up against the full force of the federal government? Changing Denver is a proud member of the Denver Podcast Network. In the shadow of the mountains, we speak. This fourth season of Changing Denver is being produced in partnership with the Denver Public Library and the Colorado Independent. You can learn more and hear past episodes at coloradoindependent.com. Special thanks this time to Len Ackland, Sins Nelson, Judy Danielson, Eric Church, Leroy Moore, David Abelson, Kristen Iverson, Marion Whitney, Bonnie Graham Reed, Tiffany Hansen, and Harvey Nichols. The other interviews you heard in this episode with Robert Card, Daniel Ellsberg, and Pam Solo were clips from extended interviews at the Maria Rogers Oral History Program. We'll put links to those specific interviews on our website, changingdenver.com. Thanks also to Tina Grigo at the Colorado Independent, Jenny LaPerriere at the Denver Public Library, Dave Ashton and Maeve Conran at KGNU, Jesse Wooten, who voiced the Edward Abbey piece and sang the old protest songs, Harper's Magazine, who allowed us to reproduce excerpts of that piece, One Man's Nuclear War. The copyright on that is 1979 Harper's Magazine, all rights reserved, reproduced from the March issue by special permission. And of course, Megan Ariano, who, among other things, read the short excerpt from Full Body Burden. Our theme song is Minnow by Felix Fast Forward. The other music for this episode and for all of Unclear Danger was provided by Ethernaut and Michael Zucker. We've got links to their work on our site as well. The remaining tracks you heard were by a group called Soft and Loathing. 
Chapter 3 of Unclear Danger is coming in about a month. Before that, we have at least one surprise in store for you. Follow us on Twitter, at ChangingDenver, if you want to be the first to know. And if you've been enjoying this Rocky Flat series, and you want more like it, you can support the show at patreon.com slash changing Denver. Shout out to our super agent backers, Andra Zeppelin, Rebecca Ehrenauer, Joel Noble, and Mark Roxwald. If you pledge at least $10, you can join their numbers next month. Until then, I'm your host, Paul Caroli. <laughs>